What does this text have to do? What does a Macedonian call have to do with Europe? Well, not a whole lot, but <laughs> hear me out. Uh, hear me out for a minute. So the Bible actually talks a lot about European countries. I know Europe as a continent didn't exist the same way it's divided up and it exists today. Uh, but, you know, you think about it, you know, that Paul talks about Spain and, of course, Italy. I mean, Roman, the Roman Empire and, uh, uh, you know, Greece is, is mentioned and, and they're speaking Greek. And so we understand that those European, what we know to be European countries today existed during that time. But for the most part, all the preaching, you know, most of the preaching was done there in the uh, Middle East and, uh, and uh, what have you. But... Uh, let me let me talk about real quickly what Europe is because uh, Europe is the smallest continent and uh, le le you know least amount of people compared to Asia and North America I mean uh, the Americas and so uh, it's got the least amount of people but there's tons of people groups and a lot of times I don't think we realize that especially if you trace down the different languages. Uh, that are European languages. 90% of Europe, the European population, uh, it comes from three, uh, I mean, they, they fall into three different main branches of Indo-European languages. Okay, so that would be the, the Romance languages, which would be Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, Ro Romanian, uh, and others like that. Uh, so we understand, uh, you know, these uh, Italian, obviously, Rome, uh, Romanian, you get this idea of what, what we mean by Romance languages. And so uh, a lot of times you'll notice French and, and Portuguese and, and Spanish, they have few things in common, right? Because they're from that same branch of uh, languages. Then we have Germanic, all right? English, German, Norwegian, Scots, Swedish, all fall into the Germ Germanic languages. And then Slavic would be Russia, Bulgarian, Croatia, Czech, Polish, those those types. So that's the three main categories of different languages uh, from your, Europe. And then uh, there's the standalone languages. We got Greek, we've got uh, uh, Albanian, Armenian, and then we've got a bunch of subgroups: Baltic, Celtic, Iranic, uh, Indo-Aryan, Turkish, Semitic, or Arabic. And so you understand all those different languages and people groups make up uh, what we know today as Europe. Now, when we're reading the Bible, we're reading the, the life of Paul and the missionary journeys. I don't know. I wonder how many of you guys, if you went to the back of your Bible, you might have a, a map that charts out Paul's missionary journeys. His first missionary journey, second missionary journey, third missionary journey. And then I think they add in after that to his journey to Rome. And uh, if you read all that, you'll see at some point where he goes into Macedonia. He goes into Greek, Greece and uh, in that area, and then he keeps going. And as a whole, the gospel gets spread all throughout Europe. Eventually, we understand that that's, uh, uh, that's what happened. So in a manner of speaking, you know, we could say our ancestors, because probably most of us in here could trace our lineage somehow to European countries, and, uh, and our ancestors were reached you know, uh, probably didn't have any effect on our lives because we're probably not descendants from their religious belief. But, but, uh, but in essence, there, our ancestors were reached through these efforts. Well, look at chapter 16, verse 9. And here's what I want you to realize, that Paul was actually, he had something else in mind. He was going to, Bithynia, verse 7, verse 7 says, but the Spirit suffered them not. He had plans to go to Bithynia. All right, verse 9 says, And a vision appeared unto Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he saw the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. We understand Luke wrote the book of Acts. And so Luke, is when he says we, he's, he's talking about Paul, but he's including himself in that. And so, uh, so here you see what's basically going on is Paul, Silas, his, his entourage there, they've got plans of where they're going. They probably charted it out. Thinking about Paul that we read about in the Bible, he probably had a plan, and he probably had every intention to hit those plans, and he's probably on a tight schedule. I don't think he had a watch, but whatever, a sundial or something. <laughs> he was on a tight schedule, and he was going to hit all those places when he was supposed to play. You know, uh, and that's just the way I see Paul. But then it says the, the Spirit suffered them not. What was it? Maybe a feeling that he had inside, that saying, man, I just don't feel like we're supposed to go there. 
you know, and he's whatever, let's sleep on it. And he goes to sleep, and that night it says he has a vision. And in the vision, he sees this guy from Macedonia. I don't know if he ever meets this guy or if it's just something, a vision that God used. Maybe he is. Maybe it's the Philippian jailer that he sees. I don't know. But there's this man in his vision saying, come help. Right? And of course, missionaries have always used this passage uh, to talk about that Macedonian call, you know, picture in your head, that person in whatever country saying, come help, come help, right? But what I get from this passage, uh, well, there's a lot of different things we could preach from this passage, but what I get some different thoughts on what happens as far as us following the will of God. And uh, that's probably one of the most, po- most common questions that I get as a pastor. People saying, how do you know when something's the will of God? You know, how do you know that that's the person I'm supposed to marry? How do you know if that's the job I'm supposed to take? How do you know if that's the church I'm supposed to be a part of or if I'm supposed to move or if I'm supposed to? And most of the time, my answer is I have no idea. I can't tell you. I can't tell you like there's no secret, you know, uh, just, you know, way of, of knowing for sure. It's God. But I think there's some things that we can learn from this story that might be helpful. OK, so uh, number one is this. Sometimes the Spirit will stop you from doing what you plan on doing. All right, just, you just got to mark it down. Sometimes you have a plan. There's something that you want to do. You might even think that this is, this is God's will. This is the best possible thing that could happen. It's the most effective I can be in my life, the most God-honoring I can be. I've got to go down this path right here. Well, be assured that that could change. God could change your mind on that. Okay, look at... James chapter 4, if you would, and we'll come back. We'll spend a lot of time in Acts 16, but James chapter 4, look at verse 13. What a great passage. It says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time. And then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Okay, so there's a time where you're so sure this is what I'm going to do. I've got it all planned out, I've got my schedule filled in, and I know this is what I'm going to do. And the Bible says, Don't say that, because you don't really know if that's what God wants you to do yet. Now, look, here's my advice. If you don't know what God's will is and you've marked it down, hey, this is the best thing. Nothing's contrary to what God says because, look, you don't want to do that. You don't want to be that person that says, like like Joyce Meyer, you know, she says, well, I know the Bible says that women aren't supposed to be preachers, but God told me, so what am I supposed to do? Don't believe it, okay? (laughs) If you say, oh, no, you know, I think that I'm supposed to... uh, do whatever. I mean, there's a thousand things I can point to in the Bible and say, you're not supposed to do this. And you say, well, I know the Bible says that, but God told me this. Look, I'm going to go with the Bible. <laughs> but I had a Macedonian call vision, right? I don't believe it. Okay, I'm going to go with the Bible. But anyway, for the most part, though, you don't know what it is. So you're just saying, hey, this lines up with the Bible. You know, it's always right, for instance, to win souls. You're not... And it's not going to be like, oh, you weren't supposed to share the gospel with that person. <laughs> you know, so do it. You know, do that what you know to be good, and do it the best of your ability. It's not wrong to make plans. You know, we do soul winning. How many times have we knocked on our our goal is to knock on these ten doors on this street or twelve or however many we can get accomplished? I'm shooting small because I usually knock doors in Iola. <laughs> okay, but uh, and so I'm going to knock ten doors on this street. And you don't even knock any of the doors because you end up talking to somebody that's walking down the sidewalk or on a bicycle or something like that. And man, it just messed up my plans, right? No, you, the thing is you had a plan, but that God intervened and he said, no, I got something else for you to do. Okay. And so this is something that we need to realize in our lives that the Bible uh, uh, shows us clearly. We shouldn't say, hey, tomorrow I'm going to do this or that or whatever, but we should rather say if the Lord allows you know, if the Lord is willing, then I'll do this or that. <clears throat> Romans 12, 2, this is kind of how we should just live our lives, though. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, and again, 
Most of the time, that's going to be saying, well, I know this is the will of God because it's what the Bible says and I'm doing what the Bible says. Okay, uh, you're never going to do something contrary to what the Bible says and say it's the will of God. But sometimes you'll be doing something that's, that's biblically sound, but he'll say, no, nope, I got another plan for you. And it's biblically sound too. It's just not, wouldn't have been your first choice. Does that make sense? And so uh, we have to understand that that's going to happen sometimes. It's real easy though to decide in our head and this is what I get a lot, all right? The same people that come to me, how do you know when it's God's will? You know what they, a lot of times they want to hear? Like they've got something in their mind that they want to be God's will, and they're like, how do you know? And they're wanting you to give them that yes, that affirmation, hey, it's okay, right? And I can't do that, because I don't know. I can only speak for myself, right? All I can say is I know if the Bible is contrary to it, then he's, it's not God's will. But, uh, but, if, if, but it's easy to say, I want to do X, Y, Z, and so you get it in your head like that's God's will. And uh, that's really easy to do. We don't want to fall into that. We want to just keep doing what we know to be right. And then when God opens up that door, boom, we know now that it's his will. Okay, so the second point is this. You may not have a vision like Paul did. I mean, that you get that Macedonian vision. That's pretty clear, right? Right after you had this feeling, man, I just don't think we're supposed to go. And then you get the Macedonian call. I mean, some people would get that and still say, well, I don't know. Maybe it was that pizza I ate. <laughs> How do you know? It was a... All I can say is when you know, you know, okay? When you know that's God's leading, it's God's hand, he opened the door, he closed that door, whatever, and you don't have to worry about trying to convince anybody because you know in your heart this is God's will, and it's obviously line, you know, lined up with Scripture, that kind of idea, then that's right. So you may not have a vision like Paul did, but when you know, you know. All right, so allow me to give some personal examples. Some of you probably heard some of these illustrations before, but uh, this is just kind of my own personal. This is how this applies to me in my life. There's been a lot of things. I'm sure there's been times where I said, hey, God wants me to do this, and it really wasn't God. Uh, but sometimes you, you don't know. You're going off your best ability. There's other times in my life where I've been like, I know that was God. And again, my experiences aren't going to be everyone else's experiences. And if somebody comes with my experience, some, with their experience, sometimes I'll be like, that just seems weird. Would God, would God show you a sign that way? Or, hey, that's none of my business. That's between that person and God, right? But uh, as long as it doesn't contradict uh, God's word. So let me tell you some things that happened in my life. So some of you guys know uh, when I, I, mean, I was a really young kid when I decided God wanted me to be a preacher of some sort, pastor, missionary, whatever. And I don't remember, I do remember telling people that God had called me to preach, but I don't remember how I knew that. It was just, I had a, I had a picture in my head and I said, I think that that's what God would want me to do. And look, the Bible says, hey, a man desire the office of a bishop desires a good thing. Anyone who is, who's a kid and says, you know what? Maybe one day God will use me to preach. Maybe I'll be a pastor or whatever. Hey, live a clean life. Keep, stay pure. Keep the qualifications. That would be a wonderful thing if God would use you to be a, a pastor someday. If not, hey, you didn't hurt your, anything by, by keeping the uh, uh, qualifications. And so live as though. In fact, Paul said, hey, covet all the spirit, these spiritual gifts. That's fine, but covet rather to prophesy. He's like, you know, you should want to be able to preach God's word so that people could understand it is basically the idea of prophesying. And so, uh, and so it's not wrong to want to do that. And I feel like maybe that's how I was as a kid. Like I just wanted to do that. I thought it was good. So I said, I'm going to just try to keep myself in a position where I can do that one day. Well, years went by, I became a teenager, preach, you know, preaching didn't sound as fun as baseball. So I, I wanted to be a baseball player. I wanted to be, you know, an artist. I wanted to do all these things, but something in my heart kept saying, no, really what you're going to do is preach one day. I remember going to camp. I didn't share this in Iola. Uh, I remember going to camp and they had a uh, preaching, uh, like uh, practice preaching or whatever you could call it. They, you get up there, you had an opportunity to preach to the other guys at camp. And uh, at that, that particular camp is where I got to know Valerie. So we spent a lot of time together. I was very interested in her and I forgot to study my notes. So I got up there to preach, didn't know what I was going to preach, didn't know. And it was terrible. It was so, so bad. And I thought, man, I don't know if I could ever be a preacher. Man, that was pretty lousy. But then something in my heart was like, yes, that's what you're supposed to be doing, okay? So anyway, fast forward a little bit, uh, maybe the next year or later that year, I'm in church at Shawnee Mission, and uh, a missionary came. And he wasn't a dynamic speaker. I could still see his face. Uh, I know he's from Argentina. I can't think of his name. Uh, 
and all I remember is that the the message was about, and we just had a missionary on uh, Wednesday and Iola preached a very similar type of message. A lot of missionaries preach this. And that's this, hey, we're going, taking the gospel to the whole world, you know, like Acts 1-8, you know, we're going into all the world and, and you can't necessarily go, but you're sending us. And they says, but your mission field is across the street. It's your neighbor across the street. You know, that's your mission field. And so, and so I remember that was a message, but in my mind, I remember just thinking the whole sermon, like God wants me to be a missionary. He wants me to go. And uh, you know what? A missionary is actually somebody who's an, like an evangelist is what we would call someone who goes out and preaches a gospel and gets people saved. That's really what a missionary is, right? But, uh, but I was like, God wants me to be a missionary. And, uh, and this is just a feeling I had. No confirmation about it, but just a feeling I had. So that, that day I went to, uh, to work. I worked at UPS on the night shift. So it was right after church. I had to head off to work. And when I got there, I met this guy, black, black guy, clearly from Africa. His name was Bubakar Fati. Uh, that's an African name, believe it or not, a West African Mandika name, Bubakar Fati. And, and, uh, and he walked right through the guard shack, which you never did. Everybody had to show their badge. But he just walked by, oh, I don't have one. And the guy just let him by. I don't know why I share that part of the story. All right. I'm not saying he was like some ghost or something like that, but it's just what happened. Okay. And I remember it, was, it struck me as odd. And after I showed him my badge and I went through, I went and met the guy. And, uh, you know, I was a supervisor. And so I was like, hey, who are you? Are you are you working? Are you loading or unloading or what? And so he started telling me what he does and all this. It was kind of like a somewhat unrelated job, but they still were supposed to have badges. And he said, uh, and I said, so what's, uh, what's your name? He said, Bubakar Fatty. I said, Bubakar Fatty, where, where, where is that from? I tried not to laugh when he said Fatty because that just seemed like a funny name. And I said, where is that from? And he said, from the Gambia, West Africa. I was like, cool, man. They speak English there, apparently, because <laughs> they do, actually. And I said, West Africa, Gambia? I never heard of it. Man, I went home that afternoon, I mean, that, that next day, all this research, studied out the country, found out their politicals. I, I, I was looking up the language. Now, look, in, the Internet wasn't like it is today. I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, I couldn't just, like, get, I didn't have a computer that, I mean, I think I, I, think I had a computer, but if I... If I had dial up internet, I think it would have taken me like five hours to, to, <laughs> to dial up. I don't know. We didn't really use it that much. Okay. So I'm just telling you, it was, it wasn't like today where you got language and everything and, and, and all this information at your fingertips. But I said, God wants me to go here. And I worked it out with this guy to go pick him up on Saturday, take him out to eat. And I was going to talk to him all about his country. And we did that. And we talked and we had a good conversation. I said, Bubakar, I'm going to Gambia. He said, hey, you let me know when you're ready to go. I'll help you get in and all this kind of stuff. He was excited. <clears throat> well, I never saw him again after that. I looked around. I asked about him at work. Hey, do anybody know Bubakar Fatty? Who's that? Bubakar Fatty. <laughs> I'm walking around, and I never found him again. And in my heart, I'm like, that's it. God wants me to go. This was a sign. This was the Macedonian call. And I went to Bible college because my, my, when I told my pastor about that, he said, well, I don't know what to tell you except for go to Bible college. And so went to Bible college and uh, after a few years decided Bible college wasn't for me. <laughs> I'm going to find another way to get to Gambia, West Africa. And uh, I was in a good church. Thank the Lord for that. But the college wasn't very good. And another college opened up in Heartland, and I said, I'm going to go to Heartland. And uh, long story, again, felt like I should go, but didn't know exactly. So anyway, I just went with it, went to Heartland. I was there for a long time. It wasn't long before I said, I just don't think Bible college is for me. <laughs> but anyway, I think if you total all my years at Bible college, I was in Bible college for like 12 years or something. So I should be a doctor by now, right? <laughs> but I don't think it works that way. <laughs> I was I was there for 12 years. I didn't go to class that many, that long. But uh, anyway, so uh, so one day I was working, of course, I had a cleaning business and uh, and I've just I've always been the kind of guy that's got like three, four jobs going on at the same time. And uh, and so I had a cleaning business. But my brother in law said, man, we need somebody to wash the uh, the uh, guard shack because we got this construction going on in this in this business, uh, you know, these these trucks are coming in bringing all this stuff and it's an easy job i just need someone just to sit there it's decent pay just sit there and watch them make sure they're supposed to be there and so i said i'll do that you know I, what's another job <laughs> so i sit in the guard shack this tiny little cube and i'm sitting there and i had the radio going because that's all i really had to entertain myself i probably cleaned that thing like 
five, six times a day because it's boring. And I'm sitting around just listening to, I don't even want to tell you what I was listening to. It was like, uh, it was like all these reformed theologists and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but that was just, I didn't know. I just had it running. Had a, a, a Chuck, I think it was Chuck Swindoll on it. I don't necessarily recommend him. I'm just telling you that's what was on the radio. Uh, I mean, I don't recommend him, but that's what was on the radio. And so, uh, so I'm in there and he's just, he's preaching in the background and, uh, and, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you this. So my father-in-law had called me. Of course, I'd been in college all this time, wasn't going anywhere. And I did, I still didn't know what's God got for me. How am I going to get to the Gambia? But my father-in-law calls me and says, I want you to pray about coming and being the assistant pastor, working with youth and doing all that. And, and you can still go to Gambia, you know, later on down the road, if that's what God has for you, but I could really use the help. And I think it'd be good for you. And, I'm like, I'm not going to go work for my father-in-law. You know, that's kind of weird. And <laughs> I'm like, I got a job here. My wife's working at the college. I mean, things are going good. I don't think I want to do that. But I'm thinking about it, mulling it over. I got to give this up. I got to give that up. So I get out this paper, right? I'm in my in the guard shack. And and look, don't make fun of me, okay? Because things happen, right? I said, I'm going to do a pros and cons list. So I did pros cons and then i drew a line down the middle and right about that time chuck swindoll on the radio said some of you need to stop making a pros and cons list and just do what god's telling you to do so i called my father-in-law said well you want to talk about <laughs> this job opportunity <laughs> all right you can say well that's a coincidence that's sort of okay could be could be a coincidence I, I i agree with that but all i know is that at that point in my heart i was like you know i feel like if i don't go i'd be sinning against god and it's not, I'm definitely not doing anything wrong, going to a place where I can preach, I can uh, see people say, I can, and, you know, I can actually do what I'm supposed to be going to college to do anyway. And so I took that up and ended up being there. Now, eight years goes by, I'm getting familiar with the job, I'm getting used to it, youth groups growing and, and, and I'm getting things down. But Brother Collins, his health is getting bad and he's, and he's been there, you know, 24 years and he's ready to retire. And so he tells me, you know, I'm seriously going to have to retire pretty soon. And I just want you to know, because, you know, I don't know what will happen. Like sometimes another pastor comes in and they don't necessarily want a second guy, or maybe they want to bring their own guy or whatever. And uh, quite honestly, there was a lot of problems in the church during that time. Brother Collins was in a way saying, hey, if I were you, I would just kind of get out of it and go find somewhere else. Uh, uh, he said, that would be my advice because things were getting bad. It was kind of collapsing finances and, and the attendance was going way down. And, uh, and so anyway, I, I didn't mean to share all that necessarily, but, and so he said, you know, you might just start thinking about, you know, another opportunity, you know, to do something. I'm like, that's no problem. God's going to provide, you know, God's going to, God's going to lead the next day after that conversation, or at least in, within a couple of days, I get a phone call from a guy from Texas. He has no idea that I've been talking to my pastor about that. And I don't even really know this guy that well, okay? I just know him from online. He has read some of my articles and, uh, and, and some posts on Facebook and stuff. And I met him one time at an activity, a youth activity as well. And he said, I don't know why, but I feel like God has got you on my heart. And I need to ask you if you would consider coming and working with me. Are you even in a position where you would you would be willing to do that? Like if I talk to your pastor and see what he thinks and would he give his blessing and all that kind of stuff? I was like, man, that is so weird that you called because we were just talking about how I should be looking for another uh, opportunity, you know, because he's retiring and all that stuff. I said, let me pray about it. And you can definitely call him and tell him that you're, you're talking to me about it. So, I mean, this went super fast. Before you know it, we told the church, hey, we're going to be moving to Texas. Uh, I went on a youth activity. They took, I took this, this summer, we took our kids. We had a senior camp. And then after that, we went and took their kids to Colorado for a senior camp. Then we came back and we took our kids at junior camp. It was a busy year. But I went out and took their kids to a camp in Colorado. There were three girls, uh, four girls with, including my daughter. And then Zachary went with us. And, uh, and it, it, was, it was good. Three girls got saved. One girl like rededicated her life to the Lord and said, I want to, I want to get, you know, stop the sin in my life and I want to be useful for him. And I was thinking, man, I guess God is going to use us there. Now there were some philosophical, you know, me me methodology that I had. I didn't like some of the things he was doing, but I'm like, you know what? He'll be my pastor. Maybe God just wants me to learn some lessons and just keep my mouth shut. And 
I didn't know. I felt weird. Like, why would God want us to leave, take my kids away from the grandparents and, and leave, you know, my job and leave all this? You know, why would God be wanting me to go to Texas? But I felt like that's what he wanted me to do. And I said, okay, we'll, we'll do it. All right, we get to the last days coming down. I tell, we tell Iola, hey, this is it. Brother Rocky's going to be leaving. And so they have a going away party for us. Uh, you know, there's tears being shed. We, we, we've loaded up all, we've got everything in boxes. We've got the, the holes in the wall, like the nail holes all patched up and all that kind of stuff. And we're ready to go. I've got a, a check in my, in my pocket to uh, buy the truck so we can load up everything and leave in the morning. And after that service, they give us the going away party and everything. We're going to go to the Collins house, you know, that last time with, with the Collins. And, and we're getting ready to go in there. And we're just like, this is so weird. And the whole day, everything's like, this is the last time we're going to do this. This is the last time we're going to do that. The last time we're going to do that. After that service, I go to call the Brother Collins house and I get a phone call and I step outside. And it's that pastor in Texas. And he says, he's like practically in tears. And he's like, I don't know how to tell you this but I can't have you come. I can't recommend that you come. And it had to do with finances. He wasn't going to be able to pay for us and everything. Now, look, if I felt like it was God's will, I would have still went without pay. God would provide. We'd get a job. You know, I'm, I, I can get a job easy. Not like I was making a lot of money anyway, so it would have been an easy transition. But as soon as I got that phone call, I'm like, God's shutting the door. And he's not, and, and we're not going to end up going to Texas. And I get that phone call and he's like, I don't know what to tell you. I feel so bad. And I'm like, brother, don't feel bad. <laughs> this is of the Lord, right? And so he shut that door here. I feel like he's saying, hey, this is where you're going. And then he shuts that door. There's nothing, you know, nothing really can be done. Now it was awkward coming back to Iola the next day and being like, oh, well, by the way, we're not going to Texas. <laughs> <clears throat> but so we stayed and we said, now, Brother Collins is still retiring. Now, we had never talked about like, hey, when you retire, I can be the next pastor. I mean, we, we had, you know, talked about like, what are we going to do when you retire? Someone going to be the, but Brother Collins' advice to me actually would have been at that, at that time with the condition of the church, you know, I don't recommend it. I think you ought to look somewhere else and go somewhere else. This, this church is, is, is folding. I mean, it's, it's really a bad situation is how he would have felt. In fact, he did say something along those lines. But in my heart... I felt like God shut that door in Texas and said, I want you to stay right where you are. I've got a plan for you. Now, I stayed there, and uh, the guys got together, the trustees and everything, and said, you know, what about if you retire, what about Rocky? What if he, do you think he's ready to be a pastor? And Brother Collins was like, well, I'll ask him and see what he thinks. And I said, yeah, if they want me to be the pastor and it's God's will, maybe that's why he wanted me to stay here. So we get together the way our bylaws do. Uh, we won't get into all of that, okay? But by, the way our bylaws, you got to have a vote. You got to have a, like a, at least seventy-five percent of the vote has to be yes or something like that. And uh, it's a long story, but uh, so they took a vote, and I was like one vote too short. So I wasn't I wasn't going to be a pastor. I'm like understand God what are you doing like why did you call me back why are they you know why why would they ask me to come and then not vote for me you know what's going on <clears throat> so I'm just hanging around just waiting all right I don't know what's gonna happen they're gonna find have to find another pastor he's gonna come in I don't know if that pastor's gonna want me to keep doing what I'm doing they probably can't pay me to be the assistant pastor so I'm gonna have to figure something out in the coming weeks I get like four calls from different pastors. One was in Missouri and three other ones were in Kansas. Each one of them saying, hey, I heard Texas didn't work out for you. I'm getting ready to retire. What do you think about coming, working with me for a little while? And two of them are in Missouri, I just realized. <laughs> coming with me and working for a while and then when it's time, I'll turn it over to you like in a year or whatever, I turn it over to you, you'll be the next pastor of the church. Some of those situations, if I was looking at it from a financial standpoint or from like, a, hey, there's a lot of people in this church, and the success, you know, that preachers are looking for, then I might have jumped on some of those. But in my heart, it was like, no, I got to keep doing what I'm doing. I got to stay right here. And then, you know, that little voice in your head is like, wait a minute, they didn't vote for you. They don't want you to be the pastor. No, another call. Hey, you going to come? You, you, you th what do you think about coming out here and being the pastor? And I had to start telling people, no, I think God wants me to stay right here. 
And I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm turning down all these job offers and I'm straight here at a church that's about to fold. Nobody's coming and they, and they don't even, they're not even voting for me to be the pastor. But something in my heart's like, stay right here, right? Then they, I guess a couple people in the church left and maybe they were the ones that were voting no or something. So the guys got together and said, let's take another vote. Take another vote and the rest is history. I don't know, I'm the pastor there right now. And I could just go on about how this work started here in Kansas City and all that stuff. You say, well, how do you know? How do you know? You try to read the signs if you want, but ultimately when it's when you know, you know. I mean, it's just it's like you you know there's no other option. You know, God can shut a door or he can open a door and he can make you know, like, this is what I have to do. And you can be so confident when you do it that you're not worried about anything because you know God's going to take care of you. Let me get to, to the next point real quick. So that was uh, point two. So sometimes the Spirit will stop you from doing what you plan on doing. You may not have a vision like Paul did, but when you know, you know. Number three, the results might not look like what you thought. <laughs> okay? This is, I guarantee you, every, this is 100% of the time. You're just like, I know what's going to happen. God wants me to do this. This is what it's going to look like. No, it's not. <laughs> Don't even try to guess like what it's going to look like. Just follow God and, and say, hey, I know I'm in his will. I'm following his lead. I'm praying and asking him to guide me. Uh, he's closing doors and he's opening doors. And, uh, and I'm going to do his will. It's not going to look like anything like you think it's going to. But you'll know you're in his will and you'll be just you know, happy the whole way. Let me give you some examples. You're in Acts chapter 16. Look at verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened that she attended unto the things which were spoken of, uh, of Paul. Now, I, I don't know the time frame, but I know that he had this vision of a man saying, come, help us. And then he gets there and here's this woman, right, that listens to him. Maybe he's thinking in his head, that's not the audience that I planned on. You know, what are you calling me here for? What's this woman, you know, sitting down here listening to me? But, but, uh, but, but you know, this is what, what he has. The results might not look like what you thought, right? Verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to, pray, uh, to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought uh, her master much gain by soothsaying. Okay, so she had some kind of a, of a demonic spirit or whatever. And because of that demonic spirit, she was able, actually able to get her, her master, so she was some sort of like slave, get her master some great gain, you know, by, you know, kind of like sorcery or magic, whatever, however that worked. Like, hey, come see the freak show, you know. And somehow they were getting money from this girl. But Paul's out preaching, trying to get people saved, you know, and preach the gospel. And he's like, all right, God's got me here for a reason. It's going to be a good meeting. You know, he's getting ready to preach the gospel. And then there's this lady here who's possessed of the devil. And verse 18 says, and uh, I mean, verse 17 says, she followed Paul and us. Luke's writing, so he says us, and cries saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show us unto us the way of salvation. So here's Paul, right? He's excited. God's called me here. He's got a purpose. We're going to see lots of souls saved. And he's preaching to a crowd, and all of a sudden this lady standing right beside him, These men are of the Most High God. I already forgot the, the line that she says. And they're just here to show us the way of salvation. Paul looks at her. He's like, thank you. Goes back to preaching. He preaches a little longer, you know, preaching the gospel, telling people how to get saved. These men are of the most high God and they come to show us the way of salvation. He's like, chill out, lady. <laughs> okay, relax, relax. He says she did this for several days, many days. All right, next day comes out, have a meeting. Whew, I sure hope that lady's not there. I'm going to have this meeting. We're going to, I don't see her. Great, great. People are going to get saved. It's going to be a great time. Here she comes in the door. These are the men of the house of God. And he's like, oh man, finally he like stops and he casts the devil out of the woman, a demon out. I mean, I'm, uh, that's the way I'm reading it. I, don't, I guess it doesn't say a demon necessarily, but the spirit of divination. And then uh, it, uh, from all I can see, then she's in her right mind. Now, I'm going to tell you this, man, uh, just... Uh, 
you guys have known the ministry. If you followed me for very long, you've been part of this work, or you've known uh, some people I've dealt with in Iola. Here's what happens, man. You think God's got you set up for a big day. Lots of people are going to come. People are going to get saved. There's going to be tears. Lives are going to change. You're going to preach the best message. And everybody's going to be like, oh, man, God, I, I repent of all my sins. <laughs> and it's just going to, what a wonderful message. There's always going to be that person. <laughs> There's going to be that person that steps in the door and you're like, oh, man, that just messed up the whole day. Right? In the flesh, that's how you're thinking. But the thing is, you just don't know. You have to follow the leadership of the Lord, and you're like, ah, I don't know. What's, it's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like. I'll tell you this, too, as a pastor. Every time you preach a message with somebody on your mind, like, I'm going to preach this message. So-and-so needs to hear this message. I'm going to preach it right to them. I try not to do that anymore. I can't say 100%. I never have anybody on my mind because sometimes it just kind of comes in your mind, and you got to preach it anyway. But, uh, but most of the time I don't do that because what I found is if I do that, the person that I'm wanting to preach to doesn't show up. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, like the whole message was for that person. Well, shame on me then. That's not how I should be preaching, okay? But I'm telling you, it never looks like what you think it's going to look like. All right? He didn't expect this woman to be his first person he leads to the Lord, Lydia. He didn't expect this demon-possessed girl is going to follow him around and mess up his meetings. He didn't expect what happens in verse 17 uh, let's see, uh, verse 18. And this she did many days, but Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrate saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. You can't help but wonder if Paul and Silas are sitting in there. They've had their clothes stripped off of them. They've been beaten probably 39 times, right? The Bible talks about how many times they were beaten, 40 save one stripe. And uh, probably backs all tore up, stripped naked, bound with, with, with uh, chains in the inner prison, right? They're like, hey, we want to make sure these guys don't get any, you know, no one breaks them out or anything like that. So we're going to put them in this, the inner part of the, like, like uh, what do they call that in prison? You got the... Uh, What's the, like, the hole. the hole, right? You're in the hole, man. They're watching you. You can't have any privileges. You might have, like, a little toothbrush or something like that. And, uh, but what do we, what do we find? I mean, I, I can imagine Paul and Silas saying, well, this sure isn't what I thought when that, when I had that vision saying, hey, come help us. I hadn't even seen the Macedonian man yet. Where is he? <laughs> All I saw was Lydia. I saw a demon-possessed girl. I saw uh, these, these guys, these Romans beating us. They could have had a pretty bad attitude about it, couldn't they have? But point three is this. I mean, point four, okay? Number three is the results might not look like what you thought, point four, but it will all be worth it if it's God's plan. Every time, mark it down. You're like, well, I don't know, man. I, I changed plans. I thought it was God's will, but it doesn't look like I thought it was going to. Well, don't quit. Don't quit because I'm guaranteeing if it's God's will, it'll all make sense in the end. And you got to stick it out. This is what they did. They stuck it out. Let's see what happened. So this lady comes, uh, Lydia, in verse 14, and he preaches the gospel, and she gets saved. But not only that, look at verse 15. And when she was baptized and her household, I don't know who all was there. It could, she could have had servants working for her. That was part of the household, uh, a big family. Who knows? Who knows who was all there, but uh, they, they, they says she got saved. Well, we know she was saved because she got baptized, baptized and her household, right? And then look at this. She besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful in the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So we got at least Paul, Silas, and Luke. Luke's the one writing this. I don't know how, how many other people were there, but at least these three men. And she says, look, you know what? Don't worry about going to get in a hotel. Don't go worry about your expenses. We're going to. 
reality. You can, you, can ba you can base right out of our house. And look, this is the first person they lead to the Lord when they're on this trip to Macedonia. And they get her, sa get her saved in her house. Now they've got a little crew of people, you know, uh, to start with. And she says, hey, you don't have to go anywhere. You can stay right here in our house. And, uh, and look, at, look at verse 40. After all this is done, after prison and all that, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. You get this idea that Lydia, he ends up using Lydia's house as a church, right? Well, that reminds me, I didn't plan on saying this, it wasn't part of the notes, but that reminds me of the story of this building right here. You know, here we are meeting at Matt Ross Community Center. And uh, we're just every every service, we got to load up. Hey guys, come come unload the... Uh, the piano and the, all the books and all that kind of stuff. And we had to do that every service, every service. And then all of a sudden, Brother Mark uh, Truitt comes by and, and, uh, and he's working out at Matt Ross Community Center. He sees a Baptist church and he comes and he says, Hey, you need a place to stay? I might be able to work something out. You know, pay, pay us some rent and we'll give you a, a, a place to meet. And I'm like, Well, let me think about it. That's a little more expensive than what he was wanting, it was more expensive than what we were currently doing i had to think about it i said well, can we come out and check it out one day and we came checked it out thought it seemed like the right thing to do and uh and i said well can we pay you this much and he said oh yeah no problem he said if you can just get somebody to mow the yard <laughs> basically what he said and so thank brother austin we've got this building because he mows for him <laughs> and uh and so so here here's what happened though here's what the, the crazy thing about it and many of you guys already know this story so our first service that we meet in here ends up being, and we had no idea about that this was going to happen. It ends up being the day that the Matt Ross or the week that Matt Ross community, community building shuts down because of COVID. So we literally wouldn't have had a place to meet, <laughs> but God gave us this building to meet in. And I'm like, man, well, you, you just got to follow the leadership of the Lord and just pray and say like, it went, you know, and when you know, you know, right? It doesn't look like you want to, but God provides. And so uh, obviously this building, when we walked in, didn't look like what I pictured our building when, once we moved into a building would look like, but it's been perfect. It's done the job. It's worked for us. And uh, we don't know what God has in the future. But here's the point that I want to make. <clears throat> it will be worth it all. In the end, if it's God's plan, you just keep following God's plan and seeing what he's going to do, and he will do it. Look, he provided them with a base through Lydia and her house and a place to meet. But then what about this, uh, because of this lady that was following them around and uh, demon-possessed or whatever, you know, and, and, and because they, they got mad and they cast the demon out, and, and now all these men are mad, the Romans are mad, and they're beating them and all that kind of stuff, I put them in jail. Come on, how can that be God's will, right? That's what you tend to think. How can that be God's will for them to do that? Well, here's what happened. Look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison door open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I mean, if you're preaching the gospel, if you want to see souls saved, that's the kind of person that you want, right? The one that's going to come to you and say, hey, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, I'm telling you, if you get thrown in jail and you're beaten and you're handcuffed and you're putting into the innermost part of the jail and you're singing songs to God and there's a big earthquake and your chains fall off and all that stuff, people are going to start asking questions, right? And say, hey, what's going on? Well, I need what this guy's got. And then uh, and, and sur surely this opened up the door. The Philippian jailer got saved and guess what? And his house. So you read it just like Lydia. Now he's got another house full of people, all saved, all baptized, ready to be preached to. And now slowly this Macedonian work is just growing, people getting saved and all of that. Had he not answered that Macedonian call, sure, he probably would have got people saved. Things still would have been going good in, uh, in Bithynia, wherever he was headed. But he had listened to God's call, 
and he had to go, not knowing what he was going to run into and encounter, and he had to follow all the step of the way. But here's the cool thing is that he knew he was in God's will. And so my last point, just kind of conclusion is this. If you know you're in God's will, you're going to be emboldened and strengthened and you're not going to fear. Okay, so look, he's not even worried that I'm going to be put in jail. You know, he's like, hey, God's going to figure this out. I'll just pray to him. I'll just sing praises and I'll just wait for him to show me what's next, what the next step is. And so uh, look at the end here. Look at verse 35. Here's more proof that they had no fear and they were emboldened. Look, it's, it's, it's great whenever you have confidence that you're doing what God wants you to do and, you're, and you can be bold and not have to worry, not to have fear. Like, oh no, what are the people going to do? Just do what God's called you to do. Here's what happens. He says, and when the, it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant saying, let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Now, look, I'm sure he's thinking, if God wanted to, he'd send another earthquake and he'd just let me out of here. <laughs> right? But this guy said, all right, you can go now. Well, look how bold he is. He says, but Paul said unto them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. See, Paul was du had a dual citizenship. He was Roman and he was uh, Hebrew. Being Romans and have cast us into prison. And now do they thrust out us out privately, privily? Nay, verily, but let them come themselves and fetch us out. I love that part. He's just like, it's like, all right, the magistrate said you can go. Tell them to come get us. <laughs> Why don't they come tell us to go? <laughs> right? Now, maybe he was thinking, hey, I'm going to preach the gospel to them, because that was his nature, by the way. He'd get arrested, and now he's standing before, you know, some guards, and he's got all the counsel there, and he'd be like, all right, hey, just a minute. Men and brethren, <laughs> hear ye this day. And he's going to preach the gospel, right? Maybe that's what he was hoping. Hey, send the magistrates to me. I'm not going anywhere until, I'm, until God says to go. <laughs> the boldness you can have, the, the, the confidence you can have that I'm in God's will, you can't describe that. Nobody can understand what that's like until they felt it. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're in God's will, and you're filled with the Spirit, and you're going to do what He's called you to do, and there's nobody that can stop you. That's what we want to be. Let's pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, you, uh, just this church and the work that you've started and the work that you're doing both here and in Iola. Certainly uh, from day one, it's never looked the way that I, ex I ever expected it would look uh, for a church that I would be the leader of. Certainly I'm not the leader that anybody expected that they would get when they're wanting, uh, looking for a pastor. But the fact of the matter is, Lord, if it's your will, you'll provide and you'll guide the way and you'll lead us every step of the way. So I pray that you do that and make it known to us. Give us the confidence and the boldness to continue the work. Give us wisdom to do things according to your will and to, uh, to change directions when you lead us to do so. And help us search your will and search your scripture daily, Lord, that we might stay in it uh, to the best of our ability and to be sensitive to following your leadership at any given moment uh, if the Spirit should uh, uh, hinder us from going. Lord, I pray you be blessed now and be glorified in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.